Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. This interview has been tape recorded and today we're going to interview Colin Sheed. Colin, thanks so, so much for coming in today. You're still serving as a police officer. I am. 18 months to go. Not that I'm counting. No, it's, mate, it's a great job and it's a job that I thoroughly enjoy. 30 years, there were high points, there were low points and we've all gone through those. But your, your low points have been particularly low and um, as a result, you've you know, it's caused you a number of issues. However, yeah. we'll come on to that and we'll just start off at the beginning. So, Colin, what, what did you do to start off with? Where, where, where were you brought up? So, I was born in Rochford back in 1971. Uh, and then for the first eight years, lived in Hadley, Essex, as opposed to Hadley in Suffolk. And then uh, moved to Benfleet, where I joined up as a special constable back in 1990. Three months before joining as a special, I joined as a member of uh, support staff with the Metropolitan Police. And then uh, those kind of two careers, uh, as a special constable and as a member of police support staff, then went hand in hand together uh, until 2003 when I combined the two and then joined up as a regular. So what was the inspiration to join as a special constable though? Because I think that's commendable. Anybody that wants to be a special they need an extra pat on the back because it's a hard enough job anyway, but to do it as a volunteer, which is absolutely fantastic. What was your inspiration? What made you go down that route? Well, I always remember, even from a young age, I'd wanted to become a police officer. I don't know what was in my mind to become a police officer. Um, and I remember bumping into uh, a guy called Gordon Sinclair, who was our beat officer and our community policing officer with the schools. Um, and saying to him that I wanted to become a police officer. And he said, well, if you're thinking about doing it, you're way too young. Um, why don't you join the specials first and get an idea of what policing's about um, and then see the world, grow up, and then decide what you're going to do. But I was too keen and too eager. <laughs> so uh, when I left school, I went to work for an American insurance company and then went to the City of London and worked as an insurance broker um, and it just wasn't me sat in an office. I couldn't stand being sat in an office all day. So um, I applied for the Met as a member of support staff. I applied for customs and excise at the same time. Um, but March 1990 started working for the Met um, for the Metropolitan Police and City of London Company Fraud Squad. And that's where I spent three and a half years oh, working on, on the Central Criminal Intelligence Bureau. And I absolutely loved it. Um, but actually, policing was never my chosen career when I was at school. I actually um, spent five years working in hospital radio. Uh, I used to work for Essex Radio down at South End as well as a runner in the studios. Um, and I wanted to go into broadcasting. But I always remember my teacher at school saying to me, you'll never work in broadcasting because you're not bright enough. Little did they know. <laughs> Little did they know. <laughs> you'll never work in broadcasting because you're, uh, you're not bright enough and you're, you're never going to get A-levels. So it was a bit of a kickback, really. So, um, so insurance was my first career and then uh, fell into policing. It, it's a great job. And, and, and the special constabulary has changed quite considerably since you were a special because Huge. now they can undertake pretty much any role within, yeah. it, other than firearms. I don't think there's any firearms officers yet. No. But yet. they carry tasers, they can go yeah. on traffic. And what I like about the, certainly with the City of London, they encapsulate the skills of people from other worlds. So your accountants will go yeah. and work in a fraud office and it's really, you know, it, it's quite good. And I don't know how many specials there are in Essex now, but there's, there's, there's quite a few. Um, and they do a great job. I mean, yeah. and, and Derek Hopkins is a classic example. He's, yeah. been, he's been doing it for the well, best part of 40 years. He must yeah. be now. Yeah, it, it is. Um, because it is a greater link between the, 
the community and the police service. And then we, when, when you talk about sort of the Pelian principles about the public being the police and the police being the public, that is a massive link. Um, and I found that as a special, because you tended to live and work um, in the same place, your intelligence was a lot greater. You knew the little rat runs of where to go. You knew where people were going to be hiding out. Whereas if you, say, live in Chelmsford but work in Harlow, you're less embedded within the community. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think for the police service, and I'm not asking you to comment on this, Colin, but the police service in 1994, it changed that recognition when police yeah. houses went. Yeah, it did. And the, you, your community policing started in the police houses because they were built on estates where there were uh, denser populations, etc. I mean, we lived in a police commune in Colchester. I call them communes in the nicest possible way. Yeah. And it was it was great, but there was there were no problems in that area because everybody knew that the old Bill lived in those houses. So they, they, they self-policed, if you like. So where, did you, where were you stationed as a special? So I started off at uh, Basildon as a special. No, I didn't. I started at Benfleet. Started at Benfleet and then I got promotion to, I think, what was called a, um, um, a section officer or something like that. It was equivalent of like a special sergeant. I went to Basildon. And then because of my work, um, I then ended up going to Hoban. So I transferred over to uh, the MEP and I was at Hoban uh, for a while. And then with my work, I then uh, went to Hackney as a special. Then when um, my ex-wife and I then moved back to Essex, um, I then went to Tiptree, come back to Essex uh, as a special constable there, and then gradually got promoted and ended up as a special superintendent at Colchester looking after Colchester and Tendering. So what are the differences, the, the policing differences, between being a special constable in Essex and being a special constable in the Met? Completely different. Um, and that was a bit of a culture shock for me. Going from Essex, where you were part of a team, you're very embedded within a team, um, and you felt valued. When I went to the Met, I mean, I was fortunate because I knew uh, the officers where I, I was a special, but you were very much on your own, and you were used for the football um, and the festivals that would go on up there, but you were never part of a response team. You would never, ever be seen uh, in a response car up there. Um, and the special constabulary in the Met seems to run, or certainly back then, was very much in isolation away from the actual response officers. Whereas when I came back to Essex, uh, the special councils were very much embedded within the community policing and response teams. Yeah, and I, I've got to say, up until the point I retired, the special constables were a valued member of the team because sometimes yeah. you weren't fielding, you weren't fielding twenty people on the shift. No, you know, at Harlow, we'd, sometimes we might have six or seven people if we were lucky, including the yeah. sergeant. So to have two or three specials, that would bolster the, the 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 team considerably, and they were a welcome addition. And if anybody's got any thoughts about joining the police, certainly go down the special route first if you can't get in immediately into the regulars. Yeah, when I left uh, Stanway Rose Policing Unit, um, if I only had two PCs uh, covering nights, then I would look to the special constabulary and get some experience uh, from there. And that would give me two cars instead of four. And a really valued member of, uh, of the policing team. And they, and they enjoyed it. And we enjoyed them being with us as well. Yeah, and they're, they're, they're really good people. Anyone who gives up their Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve... Many of those. Yeah, it's, it, you know, it's... it's it's hard enough anyway, but when you're doing it free of charge, which they are, they're giving their time up. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. So you join Essex Police in 2003. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you go to from when you first came in? So I went to uh, Halstead uh, as, a, uh, as a PC and then became a uh, community policing officer covering the cones. Um, and then uh, New Year's Eve... A uh, year of the tsunami, I ended up um, hitting black ice coming home after a night oh, shift right. and rolled my car into a ditch, knocked myself out, and then came back to work uh, on restricted duties and they decided to put me on CID. Oh, well, that's one word, isn't so, it? <laughs> Everyone else had to get burglars locked up. But <laughs> so, um, it's a bit it's, drastic going into a ditch, though. Yeah, so I ended up as, uh, as almost like a CID aide. Uh, working uh, with Rob Coltman, and uh, and I really enjoyed it. 
Um, so he's a uh, nice guy. Rob yeah. Um, and then Greg Potter spoke to me and he said, uh, he says, there's a vacancy coming up on CID for you. And I went, oh, right, okay. Then I didn't really think much of it. Um, and then my time ran out, sort of, uh, I, was, I was back to full fitness. And uh, Tony Sowers said, oh, yeah, you're coming back. I went, oh, I said, uh, Greg Potter wants me to go, back, go on CID. He said, no, you've got a job to do. You've got to come back onto, uh, onto the team. So I went, all oh, right, okay then. So I was only back a few weeks. And then uh, and I was on a search course at headquarters. And Greg Potter turned up at headquarters. And he said, there's an application on your chair in the classroom. I said, oh, what's that for? He said, uh, for CID, coming on CID. <laughs> Brilliant. So, all right, okay then. So I applied for it. Uh, and then it ended up on CID uh, at Halstead and then uh, and then on to Braintree before I got promoted. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was really good. Yes, CID is a, it's a great, it's a good way to learn how to investigate. You know, it's, yeah, it is. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not knocking anybody else, but I think that, you know, I was having this conversation with Ivan Dibley last night, who was an S, one of my SIOs, top bloke. He was the SIO for the rest of the murders and, you know, one thing and another, but yeah. really, really cool. And I, I, and I don't think many people enjoy being disclosure officer, um, but it was one role. We, we, we were made to do all our own disclosure work, and I have to say that doing that work was an eye-opener because it made you go back over your own investigations and check everything that you've done. And at times I used to find loopholes in my own work and then think, oh, I've missed this. Yeah. Um, and that is a way to learn because if you can get that bit completely closed off, then it gives the prosecution, you know, they've got lots of ammunition and the defence have got nothing to go in with. And, it, yeah. and that's, I, I, I did disclosure many times on uh, major crime and sometimes there were thousands and thousands of documents and... Yeah, it wasn't always joy. Let me put it that way. No. But yeah, you know, like you say, it's the it's the way to learn. And you just if ever, ever anybody gave me a question around resilience, I think it's the times that I got put in as a. In fact, in fact, that's why I got promoted. That's why I took promotion because somebody else was acting. Yeah, and every time disclosure came up, I got it, and um, I thought the only way I'm going to do this is by getting promoted. So I took my <laughs> exams. I got promoted. And that person hadn't got their exam, so they had, it was a face accompli. They had to make me the acting sergeant. Yeah. And guess what? I didn't do disclosure anymore after that. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you're on CID. Where do you go to from, from CID? So I'd passed my sergeant's exam and my detective exams. I, I sat them back to back. Uh, so one week I'd done my um, NIE exam, and then the following week I'd done the sergeant's exam. I remember coming out of the hall at headquarters and spitting feathers. Things I said, "Why do they put these trick questions in, in this exam?" And uh, I thought, "No, I failed it." And I, and I remember then, Greg had said to me, "You got two chances of passing the uh, exam. If, if if you don't pass it, then you're off a of CID." So I really worked hard for it. And then uh, the following week, went into my sergeant's exam, come out of the hall at uh, Colchester, and thought, "I failed it." They just seemed too easy. And I got the results and I passed. I thought, well, that's a bit of a relief. So I sat on the exam for about a year and then went down to Grays as a, uh, as a TDS um, and then applied for a post at headquarters uh, on the Intelligence Support Bureau, which was like part of the Force Investigator, uh, uh, FIB, yeah. Force Intelligence Bureau. Um, and then I was on there for about a year and then got an approach by one of the ACC staff officers who said, um, Mum's after a staff officer, are you interested? And I went, no thanks. I said, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. And who was that at the time, Julian? Oh, oh, no, no, it wasn't actually. Oh, it, was, right, uh, okay. it was somebody else. Okay. Um, and then a short while later, I got another approach saying uh, the boss is after a staff officer. I said, right, okay. And a friend of mine had joined up with Derek Benson. So um, I thought, okay, I'll, uh, I'll pop over and go and have a look. Met Derek and um, spoke about the job and then put my uh, A57 in to, uh, to go through and was told that uh, it was going to be an A57 and a presentation afterwards. Uh, popped off to Scotland, 
was up at the top of a hill, mountain, whatever it was, having lunch with my mate and get a phone call from Luke Collison saying, uh, congratulations, Colin, uh, you've got through. I said, oh, right, love it. Cheers, boss. Thanks very much. Uh, when's the interview and the presentation? He said, no, you've got through. <laughs> I said, oh. He said, no, the boss likes you. So uh, you're, uh, you're going to be coming to work for us. I was really chuffed. Yeah, I bet. So I said, um, when do you want me to start? He said, what are you doing at the moment? I said, well, I'm up in Scotland at the moment. He said, when do you get back? And I said, something like, oh, I'm back on Monday. He said, you start Monday. <laughs> so, wow. Right, okay. So I spent 18 months with Derek and we're still friends now. Uh, absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it being a staff officer. And, uh, and I have to say that uh, protective services as it was then, which was uh, all of crime division and all of MSD, um, was the best staff officers posts I think I could have could have had yeah because you, you're mixing with the you know you're mixing with the chief officers you're the yeah. conduit you know anyone who's listening to be a staff officer you're a conduit between um, chief superintendents and below through to the um, ACPO or whatever yeah. you know, the chief officer team and it's it's a very responsible team and it, it can put you in a bit of conflict because sometimes and I'm not asking you to comment here, I'm just no. trying to describe it, but, but <clears throat> sometimes you've got demanding chief superintendents who um, feel that their voice should be heard with the chief mm. officers, albeit they've got direct lines to some of the chief officers anyway. Yeah. And you have to balance that, and you, you're the one who has to mitigate the, the, the two. So, no, it's, it, it is an interesting role. Wise words, I think, from Gareth Wilson on the first sort of uh, few weeks that I was there. And he said, uh, just remember, you are not... The ACC. You're not the ACC. Yeah, you're not the deputy yeah. chief constable. You're 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 there as the sergeant, yeah. and you're yeah. And when people, absolutely right. Yeah. And when people say to me, "What do you do as a staff officer?" I've always said, um, uh, "Anything that you're asked, and everything you're told." Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you're there as a staff officer, and then where do you go to from your staff officer role? So the boss. Um, said to me that he was looking for promotion and that uh, it was now probably time to uh, look outside the house um, because if he gets promoted in force, you get a new staff officer that, that goes with the rank. Uh, or if he was successful outside, then I, I would lose him altogether. Yeah. Um, and I'd always had an interest in Rose Policing. Uh, when I was on CID, within the very first few weeks of being on CID, I always remember uh, Greg Potter sit, sat in his chair and uh, popping his head up above the screen and looking at me and saying, uh, don't even think about it. And I went, what? He said, you know what I'm talking about? I said, I've got no idea. He said, uh, it's come out on Pinks, which is like the enforced advert yeah. for, uh, for jobs. I said, what has? He said, traffic's come out. He said, I know you're interested. I said, I actually haven't even seen it. He said, well, don't even think about applying because I'm not going to sign you up to leave. So I thought, well, right, okay. <laughs> so as a PC, I never went on to traffic. So, um, and I said to the boss, I said, uh, I'm actually interested in going on to traffic. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah. He said, well, best you have a chat with Gareth then. So, and Gareth uh, was the chief superintendent on MSD. At yeah, he was. He? Yeah. yeah. So um, he said, look, he said, we're, we're setting up the serious collision investigation units. So we're looking for detectives to go on to there. Are you interested? I said, I am. However, I actually want to go and learn my craft as a, as a Rose Policing Officer first because and I don't know whether that was a wise decision or not. Um, but I want to learn my craft before I actually go and work actually on investigations dealing with serious and, and, and fatal road collisions. Um, so I ended up going on to traffic uh, as a skipper and... Um, First posting was uh, Central, so uh, Dunmo, so we, we covered Chelmsford um, and Malden districts. Uh, and eventually I spent uh, almost 10 years on roads policing. Did you really? 10 years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. See, I've got a theory as a detective, as a died in the wall detective. Burglars have to get to burglaries, they don't yeah. walk there. Yeah. Um, if, you can, if you can attack crime from <clears throat> that end, from the from the... Uh, take away their cars, get them banned. All of a sudden, people go, oh, look, there's... He's dead now, Bobby Watkins. There's Bobby Watkins, he's a burglar. Yeah. 
they'd let him drive off into the sunset, some of them. But if they said, oh, there's Bobby Watkins, he's a disqualified driver, all of a sudden the world and his wife would be on top of him. Yeah. And he would be arrested in a heartbeat. And and that, for me, was always a natural progression. And, and I've got a lot of time and a lot of respect for um, the traffic guys and girls because I think they, they do a really good job. And, and I had this conversation um, with Kevin Gay the other week. Their knowledge is absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Anybody who can pass a tra- traffic exam, I thought taking the sergeant's exam and the inspector's exam was difficult. But when I yeah. look at some of the stuff that the traffic people have to do, it's enormous. Yeah. Well, you do you do your your initial uh, course when you go into traffic and your traffic law course, and that's more exams passing that. When you become a, a vehicle examiner, that's another four-week course. That's the equivalent of like a city and guilds course. Uh, and funnily enough, Kev Gay was one of my governors. Oh, I was he? Uh, down yeah. in Chigwell. Love uh, him. And probably one of my best governors I've ever had. Yeah. Um, but roads policing isn't easy. No, it's not. And I went on there having come out of the big house and, and been, been a detective. And there was um, a lot of work for me there. Uh, and, and as you say, there was a ch- change of mindset as well um, around denying criminals use of the roads. Um, and very good at looking for your mobile phones, your speeders, and everything else like that. But as you say, burglars use cars, um, transient criminals coming out of London, crossing uh, up the M11 in its Cambridgeshire. Uh, it's it's out there. And and, and funnily enough, uh, when we talk about traffic stops, um, and this is a case that's been dealt with uh, o- o- over and done with now. I uh, was going up the M11 one night duty and uh, a car pops out of what we call the, the turning post up at the Newport Gates. Yep. And um, and I stopped this guy and said, uh, so what are you up to? He said, oh, I just want to get back onto the motorway. So, all right. I said, so you've come through like the no entry. I said, yeah. I said, well, there you go. There's, there's your the, ticket. There's your ticket. And, uh, and that was the end of it. And then uh, probably about a year or so later, I get uh, a phone call from the National Crime Agency saying, do you remember doing this stop on the motorway at this time of night? I said, yeah, I do. He said, blimey. He said, that's quite clear. Sort of cut answer there. I said, I do, because I don't often catch people up there doing that. No. He said, um, can you do me a statement for it? I said, yeah. I said, what do you need? He said, all I need to know is uh, day, day, time, and place that you stopped this vehicle and who you spoke to. I said, right, okay then. And it turns out this guy was a scout for uh, an organised gang who were casing places like Audley End House uh, and other museums and stately homes, uh, Nicky Fine Art. Well, there you go. And and like you say, if you didn't utilise your skills as a traffic officer, then that person wouldn't have been brought to justice. Yeah. And it does it does make a hell of a difference. I mean, the the AMPR capability, absolutely love it. I think, you know, the cameras, every car should have cameras on them. And the invoking the powers that the, the, the traffic legislation is so powerful that it's one thing that should be utilised more by officers. And yeah. I think sometimes it's... I'm not saying that the stuff gets lost and I'm not asking you to comment, but, I'm, but I think sometimes it's too difficult or some people see it's below them. And I'm a, I'm a bit of a... I suppose I was a bit of a, a job's worth in a lot of ways because I would deal with people for what I saw, you know, whether even if I was on CID, if it was a matter that I could get get it home, then I would utilise all the legislation, yeah. not just the piece that I was investigating. I look at it as uh, more than one way to skin a cat. You might not get them a conviction for burglary, but you might get them for no insurance, you might get them for driving whilst disqualified. Yeah. Um that's a quicker and easier way to get some detection sometimes with those types of Yeah, people. absolutely. And as I've said previously in a previous interview, Al Capone wasn't locked up for being a gangster. He was locked up for his tax evasion. Yeah. And that is the difference. You know, yeah. you've got to approach crime, criminals, prevention and detection from a different perspective. I always remember jumping in the car with your brother as well <laughs> when, uh, when we were on CID at uh, Braintree. And, uh, and your brother jumps up and says, come on, Sheedy, off we're going. So where are we going? So we're going out. He said, there's a car driving around somewhere. And, like, we're in the car like, going off looking for someone. Yeah. But they were a burglar. Yeah, and that, and that was it. I, I um, Yeah. and that, but, but if you've got the passion for the job, you've got the passion and that's it. So you're on traffic. You then, you go on to the fatal 
collision unit? Excuse no, or? no. I stayed on Rose Policing, um, worked at where uh, we'd closed various garages and then we moved, moved it to just two bases, one at Chigwell and one at Stanway. Uh, and then my last post was at Stanway. Um, so I ended up qualifying as a, uh, what was back then called a road death scene manager. Right. Uh, but it didn't necessarily have to be a death. So we then became road scene managers uh, where we oh. lead the initial uh, golden area part of the investigation yeah. for a serious or, or, or fatal collision. So the RSM is it's a very responsible role, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you're the one who's making the decisions and policies around what you've got in front of you. Yeah. What you're going to do, where you're going to start your uh, your initial line of inquiry, um, what happened, how it happened, um, about securing the scene, gathering evidence, um, and it is very fast time when you're there. Who's, who's going to be sent where? Uh, sometimes if the air ambulance comes in the lands, whether you're going to put someone else in the air ambulance and, and they could fly off anywhere to London, uh, to the Royal London or St Thomas's uh, or up to Addenbrooke's. And, and you've also got... Um, you've got a team of there's, there's scientists, the skew people who are actually scientists, aren't they? The degrees that they have in order to carry out their work. Yeah, the forensic collision investigation. The forensic collision. Yeah. I mean that is that's a fascinating role, and yeah. uh, and how you use that. Bear in mind what we do is around transition out of the police service. I know we're not here to talk about that with you yeah. today, but how you use that in the outside world, I really don't know. But they've got some skills that are very very deep rooted, and uh, I mean they do a great job. They can tell you how fast the car was yeah. going, or whether a light bulb had blown prior to the accident taking place, and all those types of things. It's brilliant. Yeah, and I, and I learned a lot from them as well. And and I, when I used to choose the people uh, who I wanted them to then become RSMs, um, and I always remember going to one crash on the A13, and the forensic collision investigation officers like off in like the distance. I was thinking, where has he gone? And he comes back and he walks back to me and he says, oh, the crash started back there. It's like half a mile down the road. I said, how do you know that? He said, I'll oh, come back with me and I'll walk you back. And uh, there was one tiny scuff mark, which was a new scuff mark on the curb. And he said, that's what's happened. She's hit the curb there. And that's where this collision started to happen. She's bounced off the road and hit the central reservation and, and that's how it's happened. Um, and that's one thing that's lived with me forever is walk the scene. And it doesn't matter how back, far back you go. Obviously, there comes a point when you're sort of like heading into the sunset where it's too far. Yeah. Um, but yeah, walk the scene. Um, and again, changing that mindset for people. Um, and I remember going to a crash and I said, right, I want you to knock on all the doors of all these houses that are looking over to see whether they've got a camera or anything. And I think, well, what do you want that for? I said, because it might have captured something. Yeah. And if you've got line of sight or something, you can see something, then they can see something. Yeah, absolutely. So when did it all start, start going wrong then, Colin? What was, because, you know, the, the reason we're here is to talk around your PTSD. You've, yeah. had, a, you've had a distinguished policing career and mm -hmm. when you finally retire, I'll, I'll glean all your, your, your stories and all your funny <laughs> bits, of, you know, your high points and your low points. But, well, these are the low points. Yeah. But where did it Where did it start going for you? Where did it start going wrong? I probably didn't re recognise it or realise it until um, I got injured. But before that, I remember going to a, uh, a double fatal uh, down at Fanbridge with uh, Brad and Abby. Um, two um, teenagers on a motorbike um, who were sadly killed uh, together. Um, and I remember going back to to the scene the day after with another police officer. We'd shut the road off so that friends and family could go, go and pay their respects uh, and actually breaking down at the scene. Mm. Um, I think I probably found that more of a relief to actually let go, uh, but thinking that it was such a waste of young lives. And it was very close to home and it was personal because uh, they were very similar ages to, uh, to my daughters. Um, then after that, um, I went to a fatal of another teenager down in Greys who was on a motorbike um, and then reflecting on that. And the trouble I found was that those fatals that you get on a late turn or a night shift, you go home to a house, you don't wake anybody up uh, and you're alone. And there's nobody there and you think to yourself, I'm still buzzing, the adrenaline's still going through me, what do I do, I want to go to sleep. Um, have a look at a bottle of scotch and you think to yourself, right, I'm just going to have a scotch and, and think to yourself, that's a good thing to, to, to help you sleep. And in actual fact, it's actually the worst thing you can do. 
Um, then you get up the next day, you go back into the office again, you're back in the car, you go to another fail, um, and you don't get time to unwind. Um, then uh, Christmas Day 2017, um, there was a aggravated burglary at a pub in Danbury um, that we turned out to from Stanway. Um, and then we were doing an area search. We had a vehicle make off from us. And that's a considerable distance, isn't it? Because Yeah, it is. Stanway to Danbury, you're talking 22 miles, somewhere in the yeah. region of that. You're flying down there at 100 miles an hour plus with yeah. blue lights on mm-hmm. because this is a very, very, very serious offence. Yeah. So your heart, your adrenaline, everything is is, is going full tilt. Yeah. Um, and he popped up and I thought, he's made off for a reason. Um, and I'm going to get him. And we were out looking. And funnily enough, I had a, a special constable with me that night um, and a, a really good one as well. And he's now a PC. Um, and this vehicle didn't want to stop. We managed to catch up with it, and he didn't want to stop. And by his, his very intentions, he didn't want us to get anywhere near him, and he was swerving all over the place. And I knew that my only tactical option was to strike him and bring him to a stop, which I did. Um, and then Jordan got out and ran. I got out and ran. Um, but the force of the impact, I didn't realise it at the time, had caused uh, damage to my right knee because of the force of the impact from the pedals coming up. Um, and we managed to catch both of them. When we're out in the field, um, it comes over the radio gun. And we thought, okay. And those hairs on the back of your neck go up and you think to yourself, we've got one, has he got a gun on him? And by that time, Jordan had already detained him in the middle of this field in the pitch black with a helicopter above us. And we had one outstanding. And he was caught on the A414 uh, going back into Danbury. So we get back to the car that we pursued and there's a handgun in the driver's footwell. And we didn't know whether it was real or uh, imitation. Uh, The firearms guys come along and... uh, Prove the, prove the gun, and it, it turns out to have been an imitation. Had he have got out of that vehicle and pointed that gun at us at the time, we wouldn't have known any different. And that's, and that's the dangers that police officers face on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, we've got listeners all over the world, and I think the Americans that will listen to this cannot believe that we have so few officers in this mm. country that are armed. But equally... Yeah. Most of our suspects aren't armed, so it no. makes it even more extraordinary when you are dealing with somebody. Yeah. I had a similar situation, but when you're dealing with someone and there is a gun involved, it really does make it more um, life-changing. Yeah, yeah. So we got him back to custody. Uh, the driver himself was drunk and under the influence of drugs. Uh, and He went away for 18 months. He appealed. I think that was reduced by six months, but he went away to prison. Um... And I realised that, that uh, I'd, I'd injured my knee but covered it up and thought to myself, um, I, I'm not going to have surgery because if I have surgery, I'm then going to be off the, off, off the front line. Um, and if they then do, do surgery on that, am I going to be able to face the, the physical again? Uh, and I loved my job and I didn't want to give my job up at all. Uh, then it got to a point where my inspector said, you're going to have to get something done about your knee. So... Um, off I went uh, for surgery on my knee um, and then went to see the FME, which is like the police doctor. And uh, and he, he looked at the wall. He, he didn't even look at me. And he just stood at the stair at the wall and said, um, yeah, you won't be uh, able to do your fitness test. I said, what do you mean like the, 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 like the bleep test? He said, no, you won't be able to do that. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do the alternative one on the treadmill. He said, no, you won't be able to do that either. I said, well, if I don't do that, then I can't do defensive skills and first aid. And he just looked at the wall and said, no, you won't be able to do that either. So I said, well, if I don't do that, then I can't go back out on the street. He said, no, you won't be going out ever again. And my whole world fell apart. And not once did he give me eye contact. And he sat there and he just wrote his notes. And I got up and I left and I went back home uh, to my then partner. And she said, how did you get on? And I said, uh, he said, I'll never go back out again. And the tears were in my eyes and her eyes. 
And I said to her, the reason why you're upset or why you, you are you, uh, as you are is because you know that I'll never have to go back out again. And that's a relief from you, from the worry. Whereas for me, that's what I signed up for. And that's, and that's, that's what I wanted. Um, and I was absolutely distraught. And it was at that point of being off that the trauma of everything else and the loss of my grandfather, um, a couple of years before that, everything then came out. And I think it was that time of actually stopping, unwinding and having that time to reflect that my world fell apart. Yeah, and it's that realisation. And you, your grandfather was born in 1920, if I remember rightly. And the, was it yeah, around? around that, yeah. yeah. It was 96 and, and, when we yeah, lost same, it. same age as my granddad. And I, I'd tell you now, mate, even now I miss him. He was 77 yeah. when he died. And he was my best mate. I worked with him when I left school. He was a plasterer. I went and worked with him. You know, absolutely idolised him. And I know you did with your grandfather. Yeah. And it does have a has a marked impact. And what, what you try and do in the police service... You compartmentalise everything. Mm-hmm. And then when it all gets thrown up in the air and it's all shaking around and yeah. it all mixes together, then the overwhelming grief around everything, it just, you know, whether it you've had a complaint, a spurious complaint from mm. a member of the public, that's one part. Then you've had, you've attended fatal road collisions, that's another. You've yeah. had a bereavement in your own family. Your domestic life, everything else, and it just builds up and builds up and builds up and there is no... There's no outlet. That's no. what I found in the in the police service. I, I, I'll be yeah. honest with you. I was the um, FLO for a, uh, a missing girl, Natasha Coombs, mm. and she was struck by a train. And we found her body 14 days afterwards. Bodies recovered from a railway side. And, been, and when I got got on the plane to go to my family holiday, every headline, every newspaper had the picture of this girl. Yeah. And I just sat and cried on the plane because. Yeah. Everything was just up against you, and you, you, you act. You know, you, you're consummate professionals. The police service are co- consummate professionals, but there is no physical outlet. And dare I say, at that time, we didn't have debriefs as, as FLOs from with, from any no. welfare point of view. And I don't know what that was like. And again, I'm not asking you to comment because no. I don't want you to criticise anyone. But but you know, it's about that internal support. It's no good somebody sitting there saying, well, you're not going to go out on the street because they don't understand mm. the baggage that you've brought into yeah. that room with you. Yeah. And that's when the flashback started. Um, and that they, 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 they were as clear as day. Of uh, and, and I know what it was. And, it, and it's the one where the young lad got killed off his motorbike down in Greys. Um, and I could still see. And, it, and it's like playing that little movie on that merry-go-round, round and round and round, where um, I can hear it over the radio and someone says, I think the dad's on, on his way down to the scene. And then just looking up the hill and the dad just comes running down the road and he just falls to his knees next to his son's body, picks up the motorcycle helmet and just throws it. And someone shouts at him for, for, the, for throwing the motorcycle helmet. I said, just leave him alone. He's next to his son's dead body and he's grieving. Um... And and that that's where things just start it was my downfall, um, and, and I've said before, and I distinctly remember on the fifteenth of June, um, we were going to a wedding, and then getting up that day and going into the bathroom, and just hanging on to the sink, and my head and my body was just the, the tightness and the pains in, in, in under um, under my collarbones. Um, and that nauseous feeling of sweating and hanging on, I think to myself, this ain't right. Mm. This really isn't right. Um, and I need to do something. I need, I need something because my, it's a really strange way to describe how my head felt. But I knew something was dreadfully wrong. Yeah, well, and it's fortunate that you did because obviously PTSD, suicide awareness, things like that, you, you, it's, if you identify the issue mm. then the issue can be dealt with yeah and I um, I phoned up Vicky Bond who's uh, head of our welfare and counselling and said um, you said said to me before about uh, going for uh, counselling um, do you mind if I give it a go and she said yeah of course she said I'm surprised you haven't asked me earlier 
I said, what do you mean? She said, I've seen the signs for years that you needed it. I said, well, why didn't you say something back mm. then? She said, because with counselling, you've got to come to us and say, I'm ready for counselling because you can't force someone into counselling because it won't work. Um, so she said, I'll do your, your referral for you now. And I think within an hour, Kate had phoned me and said, oh, I've just had a referral for you for counselling. Um, when can I see you? I said, when are you free? She said, when are you free? I'll see you this week. So I then uh, went down to uh, the clinic and um, I spent a total of 18 weeks um, having counselling uh, with Kate. And I turned up on day one and she said, so why are you here? I said, because I don't feel right. She said, okay. She said, um, do this questionnaire. So you go through like a, like, almost like a psychometric questionnaire to determine whether you've got PTSD or whether you've got depression. And um, she, I filled in the, the questionnaire and she said, you've got classic P PTSD. And it was actually a relief have, having it labelled and actually thinking to myself, okay, I now know that there is something wrong with me. And I, it's not just me thinking that I'm not right. So she said, um, so have you got one thing that comes to mind that causes you issues? I went, yeah. She said, well, that was easy answer, wasn't it? I said, yeah. She said, three? I said, yeah. I said, there's, there's definitely three things there that cause issues. So she said, six or more? And I had to be honest with myself and say, do you know what there is? Um, so she's right, I want you to go away and make a list and then come back and then we'll start working through your list. Um, and I thought, right, okay, where are we going to start? Because like week two, you sit down and you give her the list. And she says, right, okay, uh, we'll deal with the crash down at Grays, dealt with that. Um, I had a plane crash on the A414 uh, just outside of Chelmsford, which was another issue. Um, and then that, the week came and she said, next week we're going to do your granddad. And mm. that was tough. Yeah. Really tough. Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting because people see us, you, me, you know, we're, we're tough old coppers, but actually we're not. And everybody I've ever worked with, they might have been grizzly bears, but they're not yeah. because they've all got a heart and th we... we I think people just cover things up. And, I, and do you know what I like about the modern police service is that you are now encouraged to tell people that you're not right. Whereas before, you've got people, they just got on with it, they became grumpy, they came, became completely disillusioned with the job. And we all go through stages of that at some point. Mm. But, but the fact is that there is now the proper support around PTSD. So how have you manage that I mean that's that's um, another part to it because yeah. you, you know your 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 love for the police is you know quite clear you, you you your proactive element you know is very obvious but how have you coped with the PTSD what have you done to overcome it well, the ironic thing was that even before that I was a trim practitioner and still am a trim practitioner so uh, trauma trauma risk management practitioner and I was talking to people and saying, we're going to have a chat and a session. But because I think I was older than most people and of rank, I was absorbing other people's yeah, trauma and then thinking, right, I'm okay because I'm, I'm a leader. And then afterwards thinking to myself, actually, I should have been more honest with myself. So with the um, counselling sessions uh, Kate and I then uh, spoke about medication uh, and not one medication works for everybody and sometimes you can go onto one medication it doesn't work and you have to get that reviewed and you change to a different medication um, I was lucky in that um, the medication that we discussed and then I went on to worked for me and worked really well for me um, but I had the counselling sessions and I was a good student when it came to doing the homework because had I not have done it, then I don't think my recovery would have been as good. So the mindfulness, the relaxation, um, alternative therapies in terms of like massage, aromatherapy, Alexa for me was a good tool as well. Because She'll I could, come on in a minute. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say her name again. No. Um because there's some tools on that as well that you can use yeah. for, for relaxation. It's around uh, trying to get the brain to switch off, which I which I learned. 
um, reading. Uh, but my greatest hobby as well is the photography. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and after the death of Brad and Amy, um, I met a photographer called Russell Savory uh, down at Stomari's Aerodrome, who became a great mentor and comfort for me um, in terms of uh, him sending me a text saying, right, okay, we're going to go out and do sunrise, we're going to go out and do the little owls, the barn owls. And, uh, and I say, yeah, get good. I'm off today. I'm up for it. Uh, what time shall I meet you? He said, I'll be here at three. Three. That's like before I even get up for an early turn. <laughs> so, uh, so we would go down to such Stomaris and, uh, and set up. Um, and that really got me back into photography. I'd started doing photography for probably when I was about 15 years old, but it become, it, it, it was a pastime. Uh, but with Russell, it became a real passion and a real hobby, uh, an expensive one as well, yeah. but definitely worth it. And the thing with that is, is that you're sat there, you're concentrating, you're paying attention, uh, waiting for something to happen. Most of the time it would happen, but your eyes down the lens um, and you're not thinking about anything else. So anything that's happened in the days, the weeks beforehand, and anything that's going to be coming up and worry about sort of like in, the, in, in, the, in the next couple, couple of weeks is gone. And, and, um, and for me, that was my fix. Uh, and I found it really, really helpful. Yeah, and I've, I mean, I've, I've known you a long time and I've, we've been out taking photographs together and I, I love the work that you do and I love the situations that you get yourself into you know working over uh, doing the beavers mm. badgers owls the whole yeah. lot I'm actually I'm jealous because you you know you, you get to go to some really great places and get some great shots when you are out there and you've switched off completely mm -hmm. how does that transform when you get back in your car do you switch back onto the the, the negative side or does it does it help you maintain that the positive element? Um, it maintains the positive part because then your mind's on going back home again, looking at the, the photos on the big screen, seeing what's ones that come out. Digital photography is so much... I say it's, it's easier. It's easier in some regards of like... Well, everyone's get, a photographer now, aren't they? Because everyone's got an iPhone. You know, iPhone, 20,000 yeah. photographs, blah, blah, blah. But it's, yeah. it's about having that eye to take the photo in the first yeah. place. And it, it's take 100 photos, delete 99, and then you've got one. Because I'm very critical about my photos. Um, and, and then you're left with that one shot, and it's what you're going to do with that one shot. Um, and I have been fortunate um, to have my photos used by the Essex Wildlife Trust uh, and the BBC. So, and that is a great reward. But then looking for which ones are you going to use, it, it, it takes your mind away again. Um, yeah, absolutely. And to have it published and to to, to go there, and it's Russell, isn't it? He, he yeah. does a lot of work for the BBC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is absolutely fantastic. And what sort of equipment do you use? So now I'm on the uh, Sony A7 uh, with a Sony 200 to 600 lens, uh, which is my go-to camera and my go-to lens. Uh, I've got the uh, big lens, the big Sigma lens, which weighs a tonne. Um, but now that Sony is just a fantastic camera. Um, and I've moved a lot more towards uh, filming now um, rather than the photography. But then I have to remember to myself as well, oh, you must take some photos as well. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the videos are, are great, but some of those in flight action shots of the, 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 um, the owls are absolutely superb. Yeah, yeah. And, and I've got to thank you because actually um, I. One of my cameras is a Sony because of you. Um, oh, the RX10. The RX10 Mark III, which yeah. I still use. It's a cracking camera. Yeah, it is, it is and, but I don't use it as often as I should. Um, I've got really into the GoPro because it's just, it's easy to, and I, I do little videos and things like that. Well, I had the RX10 before the A7, but then I dropped, I, I picked up my kit bag yeah. one day on the Owls and, uh, and the RX10 dropped out and landed on a rock. And it smashed the back of it. And so that was like, it. Oh, no. So, uh, so, yeah, that ended up with the A7. And, again, that's down to Russell. That's yeah. why I've done this. He said, well, you need to uh, you know, go and get yourself uh, an A7. It's so, a great oh, bit. Okay. It is. And the BBC are moving to uh, to the A7 now as well. Uh, so rather than having the big shoulder camera, the, the BBC are moving over to those. Yeah, the, the, the processors and what have you are so much, so much better mm. than they were. So 
you've got another 18 months to serve. Mm-hmm. Sadly. Um, well, you know what? It's, it's, it, is, it is sad, but there's, the fact is that you love it and it, it, you're sad because your, your future's bright when you, when you retire, okay? Yeah. There's people like us that help other people, you know, help, help the likes of Collins to go out and find work <clears throat> and, and what have you. But it, it's sad because you're having so much fun. Yeah. Um, but it's positive because actually, you know, you've done your time and you've you've enjoyed ninety nine point nine percent of it. And mm. it's, it's, say it's a great job, and people would pay money to do the jobs that I did and that you've done, and and so on and so forth. It's funny you should say that because I um, we were parked up uh, out of Quindon Way uh, one day uh, doing speed checks. That's, that's this really lovely house. And uh, this guy comes out and he says, uh, would you like a cup of tea? So we go, that'd be really nice. So he comes out with this tray, a couple of cups on it and some biscuits. And he said, uh, so I've always wanted to do your job. He said, I would love to have done your job. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm an insurance broker. And I just laughed. And he said, what are you laughing at? I said, well, I used to be an insurance broker, yeah. but I couldn't stand it, being sat in an office all day and not being out and about. He said, what I wouldn't give to uh, to like, do your job. I said, but look at you, you're, you're living in like, almost like a million pound house. Yeah. He said, yeah, but money's not everything. No, but it helps. It, it, it helps. It, it and, you, bit, yeah. you know, the... the um, the police service is, is a great, um, it, it is, it's fantastic. And I wouldn't change my police service. I, I change things within my police service. Mm. I wouldn't yeah. change being a police officer. I think no. it's, you know, I, I was blessed and I did some of the best things. I travelled and I'm, I worked with some amazing, amazing people yeah. on some incredible jobs. Um, but you're not going to be rich. You don't join the police no. service to be rich. And as I say, I wouldn't ask you to comment on that. Um but the, the rewards of being a police officer from Special Constable, PCSO, working within a great organisation, if you've got a great top team, then it makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. If, you, if you're getting that support. Um, Colin, is there anything you'd like to add, alter or change before we conclude this interview? Oh, not about the interview, about my career. Yeah, my career would. I, I, I think... I wouldn't have spent as long on the roads policing, not because of the psychology of it. Um, 30 years goes quick, very, very quick. Um, and were it not for the pension scheme, I would stay beyond the 18 months because I don't feel 51. Um, and there are so many other th- things that I'd still want to do within the job. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a good career. As much, probably when you and I first joined, people would moan about the job um, and couldn't wait to leave. Uh, I think there is still some of that now, but I'd go back and do it again. Yeah, yeah, so would I. I I think, and you're absolutely right, I joined in December 86, and people listening to this, I've had this conversation before, but to put that into perspective, somebody who's coming to the end of their 30-year service and mm. there was a bloke retiring the day that I walked into Braintree Police Station on May the 10th, 1987. Yeah. He joined in 1957. Wow. It, 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 you know, I, I interviewed someone last week um, and he's he's been published this Monday coming, Alan Evershed, and he joined um, in 58, I think, if I remember rightly. And his claim to fame, he carried the radio at the 1966 World Cup finals <laughs> because the Met didn't have a radio system in place. So he had to carry a military radio in a backpack wow. and he sat on the halfway line. <laughs> and that's, But that's how the police service has evolved. I yeah. mean, and, yeah. and it might be interesting, when you do finish, I'll get one of the old and bold in and we can, we can look at the almost 40 years between him joining and you joining yeah. because the, the differences... But it's the same principle, the peeling principles, the principles that were adopted with the Bow Street Runners. Yeah. Um, it's still around that. And, yeah, of course the public get the hump, but the public get the hump with everything at the moment, and sometimes rightfully so. But yeah. if, you, if we've got, if, if the authorities have got the answers for the public, then the public will work with that. It's when they don't tell them what's going on or why they're in a situation. But anyway, yeah. um, Colin, I'm going to conclude this interview. 
Lovely talking to you. Thanks so, so much, mate. You're Thank welcome. you for your time. I wish you every success in the next 18 months. Um, you've got some things coming up, I know. I'm not going to talk about those here, but you know, I wish you every success. And um, I wish you a Merry Christmas, mate. And to you, Paul.